Thank you very much for uh, for listening today. My name is Coraline Ademke. As mentioned, I have a lot of years in software development, and I've been in the open source community for about 16 years. In 2014, I invented the code of conduct markdown that you see in almost every re open source repository. And I created the contributor covenant, which was the first and most popular code of conduct for open source communities. I want to start by telling you a story. In the 1960s, with growing tensions between the US and the Soviet Union, a computer scientist published a short piece that he called The Parable of the Locksmith. And this is my retelling. One day, a mysterious stranger walked into a locksmith shop and he came with a proposition. He said, I have a job that needs doing and it requires someone with your highly specialized skills. I've done my research and you're one of the smartest and most capable locksmiths in the entire city. The locksmith felt very flattered and was more than a little intrigued. The stranger continued, I want to hire you to open a safe. Never mind whose safe it is. That's none of your concern. Just do the job I hire you to do, and I will make you rich beyond your wildest dreams. The locksmith was excited at the proposition of a lucrative job, but also a bit nervous about not knowing who the safe belonged to. It seemed suspicious, but the stranger went on. There are certain other conditions you'll have to agree to as well. I will blindfold you and take your phone before bringing you to the safe's location. And you can never tell anyone that I hired you. It struck the locksmith as odd, but he thought about what the man had said about making him rich. He felt like he'd struggled all his life and is never properly rewarded for the hard work he put in day after day. You can have all the tools you need to do the job, the very best tools. I will spare no expense. Take your time. I'll be back tomorrow for your answer. Despite his hesitation about the nature of the job, the locksmith spent all night thinking about his crummy apartment, his shabby furniture, his daughter's dream of one day going to college. From the beginning, his family had to scrimp and save just to get by. And anyway, he told himself, if I don't take this job, he'll just go to another locksmith, the second best locksmith. And the next day when the stranger returned, the locksmith agreed to take the job. After multiple blindfolded trips to and from the unknown location, the locksmith finally cracked the safe. He wasn't allowed to see what was inside of it. The stranger blindfolded him again as soon as the lock clicked open. But true to his word, the stranger made the locksmith exceedingly rich. We're going to come back to this parable and find out what happened when the safe was opened in just a few minutes. This is an HP LaserJet, one of the first laser printers. It came out in 1983. And at the time, a man named Richard Stallman was working in an AI lab at Xerox. The lab had acquired one of these printers. It was cutting edge technology, but it constantly jammed. The lab had time sharing software. So you had to book time for various resources, including a printer. But if you set aside and book 30 minutes for printing, only to discover that it jammed five minutes in, you'd be upset. So Stallman and his coworkers decided to change the printer driver so that it would report jams back to the time sharing software and users could be notified. But the software was proprietary and HP wouldn't share the source code. Stallman found out that a colleague at MIT had the source code, but that person had signed a non-disclosure agreement and couldn't share it. Stallman got really angry, not just about the printer, but about the fact that the world was shifting toward proprietary software. And this incident with a printer would lead to the creation of the free software movement. In the mid to late 90s, when the world discovered the internet, free software became a popular choice for web servers. Apache became the most used web server software title that still holds. Many systems were based on a common stack of software with the Linux kernel at the base, Apache providing web services, MySQL as a database, and the PHP or Perl programming languages for produ providing dynamic pages, all open source technologies. Christine Peterson coined the term open source in 1998. In that same year, the open source definition was penned by Bruce Perrins. Nine months later, the open source initiative was, was founded to promote the use of open source software. In 
coalescing around the ideal of software freedom, the past 20 years have seen the open source community thrive, enjoying wild success and permanently changing the technology landscape. But the world has also changed in the past two decades. Around the world, we're seeing technology being leveraged to commit human rights abuses on an alarming scale. And the technology powering these human rights abuses includes free and open source software. Open source software today is playing a critical role in mass surveillance, anti-immigrant violence, protester suppression, racially biased policing, and the development and use of cruel and inhumane weapons. And open source's complicity isn't a bug, it's a feature. This is actually by design. The open source definition allows for the use of software for any purpose, including specifically for evil. They say giving everyone freedom means giving evil people freedom too. But under what other circumstances in our human societies do we grant complete freedom to evil people? Why is open source special? There's increased discussion among open source developers about our ethical responsibilities as creators. The debates are heated and the media is paying attention. The fundamental question seems to be, are we responsible for how the technologies we develop are used? And a lot of us are beginning to accept that our work in open source might be contributing to harm and atrocities in the US and around the world. In response to these questions, we're seeing increased interest in ethical open source licenses, including the Hippocratic license, which I created in 2019. As developers, we, some, we feel powerless and we wanna find some way to do the right thing. We're horrified by what's happening in the world and we're horrified at the thought that we may be contributing to it. Today, we have much bigger ethical problems than proprietary software. Stallman wanted a printer driver. We want to ensure that our work is not used for human rights abuses. That's, what's that's what we're fighting for. But the conversation about ethics and computer science is not new. It's been happening in our field since there was even any such thing as software. I wanna introduce you to a man named Edmund Berkeley. He was one of the most important pioneers of ethics and computer science in the 20th century yet almost no one knows who he is. He got to start working on computers with the Navy during World War II and worked alongside Admiral Grace Hopper. He published the world's first computer magazine and was among the first people to propose the idea of a personal computer. Berkeley co-founded the Association for Computing Machinery at Columbia University in 1947, and the organization's charter is to foster the open interchange of information and promote the highest professional and ethical standards. Berkeley sat on the Committee on the Social Responsibility of Computer Scientists, which published an historic and foundational report in 1958 on the ethical obligations of technologists. The findings of the report boil down into four simple statements. First, that we cannot rightly ignore our social responsibilities. Secondly, that our social responsibilities can't be delegated to others. Third, we cannot rightly neglect to think about how our special role can benefit or harm society. In other words, we must consider how our special capabilities can help to advance socially desirable applications and prevent undesirable outcomes. And finally, we cannot avoid deciding between conflicting responsibilities. We must think how to choose. The report went on to say that when one reflects upon the great forces that computer people are associated with, it's no longer difficult to grasp or even to accept our heavier than average share of responsibility. The committee believed that given the power and potential of computers, ethical considerations were paramount. The committee concluded the scientist credo, knowledge for knowledge's sake, comes into conflict with our eth ethical responsibilities. 
given human society in our century and the ethical value system we're using in our century, we can label some classes of work as obviously socially desirable and other classes of work as obviously socially undesirable, even acknowledging that there's a large middle ground which cannot be clearly classified. And it was Berkeley who wrote the parable of the locksmith. And remember, it was the height of the Cold War when he wrote it. The parable ends with this. A week later, the retired locksmith saw a news headline about the theft of top, top secret military schematics. And soon after that, the stranger himself appeared on the world stage, declaring himself master of all nations, backed by the overwhelming threat of a devastating soul and super weapon. <clears throat> Berkeley asked the question, did the locksmith do what was right? And he contended that the locksmith had a responsibility to determine whether the stranger was a criminal before agreeing to work with them. So no, the locksmith did not do what was right. Berkeley believed that the computer scientist does not have the right to shut their eyes in regard to their responsibilities any more than the locksmith has. And he called on his colleagues to shoulder their proper social responsibilities. And he was largely ignored. Fast forward about a decade. It's 1972 and the Vietnam War is raging. Berkeley and his colleague Franz Alt had been invited to address the ACM at a special dinner honoring them as founders on its 25th anniversary. Franz Alt's topic was reflections and Evan Berkeley was to address the future looking topic of horizons. While Alt's talk was celebratory, providing a retrospective on the advances of computer engineering and computer science since World War II, Berkeley's speech took on a distinctly different tone. He told the audience that anyone who is working to further unethical uses of computers, including the uses of computers in developing weapons technology, should quit their jobs. He called out members of the audience by name. Many of his colleagues were so upset by his comments that they stood up and walked out in the middle of his speech. And Admiral Grace Hopper was among those who stood up and walked out. Berkeley concluded his speech by saying that it was a gross neglect of responsibility that computer scientists were not considering their impact in terms of societal benefit or harm. The 1933 census in Nazi Germany used technology and services provided by IBM through a German subsidiary and proved to be pivotal to the Nazis in their efforts to identify and destroy the country's Jewish and Romani minorities. IBM, in short, was complicit in the Holocaust. The Nazis even shipped IBM's punch cards on the trains to concentration camps. How would you feel if your work had contributed to IBM's census technology? Other scientists faced similar ethical dilemmas. World War I saw the first large-scale deployment of chemical weapons and the horrors of death by poison gas had repercussions throughout the chemical production world. Between the 1918 armistice and 1933, international conferences were held to try and limit or abolish chemical weapons. And to this day in the US, no chemical manufacturer produces the serum used for death by lethal injection. And after seeing the inhumane devastation of the atomic bomb at the end of World War II, Scientists actively sought to limit or eliminate the bomb's threat to human civilization. The Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists became the voice for the ethical responsibilities of physicists. And the Doomsday Clock was launched and continues to this day as a reminder of the danger of doing nothing. But how did the computer science community deal with its ethical conflicts and the realization that they might be complicit in genocide and other atrocities. They got up and left the room. And that shirking of responsibility is pervasive in the open source world today too. Technology companies routinely rely on open source software to provide services to ICE. How would we feel about the complicity of IBM and the Holocaust if their punch card system 
have been released under the GPL because that's exactly the situation we're facing today. In 1998, when the open source definition was penned, the greatest evil conceivable by computer scientists was the market domination of Microsoft. The founding thinkers responsible for free and open software clearly understood the impact of technology on society. But rather than using an ethical framing, they chose to focus on technology in intellectual property terms. In 2021, we face threats much greater than Microsoft. We're in an age where governments are carrying out programs of mass surveillance, using facial recognition to interfere with legitimate political protest, and using technology to carry out state-sanctioned genocide and violence. And open source software is being used to power these human rights violations. In the US, ICE, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, has been separating children from their parents at the border and putting immigrants and asylum seekers in cages without reliable legal um, assistance or due process, let alone medical care. And there are an estimated 40,000 people currently in ICE custody. And there have been hundreds of documented deaths, most of them due to gross neglect. And US tech companies are collecting billions of dollars in contracts to support ISIS programs of terror. Are we also gonna get up and leave the room when we're faced with our own role in human rights abuses like these? So what does this have to do with open source? Let's take a well-known example. Palantir Technologies, a software company co-founded by top Trump advisor, Peter Thiel, collects millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars from ICE every year. At present, Palantir has 195 repositories hosted on GitHub, which in turn rely on thousands of open source dependencies. Every dependency in use by Palantir contributes to human rights violations. I created a, an application called Icebreaker, icebreaker.dev, that tracks all of the open source dependencies that Palantir is using. Thomas Kuhn argues in his seminal book, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, Revolutions, that science is always practiced within political contexts. Scientists do not operate with complete freedom. They operate within community and societal constraints. Kuhn wrote that revolutions emerge when there's a conflict between an established paradigm and a new paradigm. And we're seeing this play out in a debate between open source traditionalists and ethical source advocates. So what can happen as a consequence of this debate? What are the possible outcomes of the conflict? It really depends on how the open source establishment responds. The first possible response is procrastination. In the face of an ethical crisis, procrastination is not an option. The need is too urgent. The second possible response is assimilation. This happens when the establishment accommodates a new idea and adjusts to it in a conflict-free manner. And this is my ideal outcome. I wanna give the open source community the opportunity to accommodate ethical considerations by challenging the narrow perspectives of freedom zero and the open source definition. And I realize that's heretical. The most extreme result of the conflict between the establishment and a new paradigm is revolution. Kuhn describes revolutionaries as being motivated to solve a different problem than the establishment has prioritized. The current debate is whether solving the problem of software freedom is more significant than solving the problem of human freedom. In 1999, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan announced the United Nations Global Compact. It's an agreement to encourage businesses to adopt sustainable and socially responsible policies. It's the world's largest corporate social responsibility initiative. We have tens of thousands of participants and stakeholders in hundreds of countries. 
The very first section of the compact deals with human rights, and it states that businesses should support and respect the protection of internationally proclaimed human rights, and that businesses must make sure that they are not complicit in human rights abuses. Complicity in this in this situ in this uh, context has two different modes. The first is directly providing goods or services that a company knows will be used to carry out human rights abuses, like Palantir. The second is when a company benefits from human rights abuses, even if it did not positively assist or cause them. And this is akin to the GitHub situation. Many large tech companies have been happily profiting from human rights abuses for years. And I've been calling for those who have the safety and privilege to do so, to accept their ethical responsibilities and either organize for change at these companies or quit their jobs. This includes tech workers at Amazon, Microsoft, GitHub, Salesforce, Cisco, and Deloitte, and many, many others. Asylum seekers suffer unimaginable violence and torture violations of their dignity, safety, and basic human rights in government concentration camps across the US. Amazon, Microsoft, GitHub, Salesforce, Cisco, and dozens of other companies all leverage open source technologies to profit from human rights abuses. And according to the United Nations definition, these companies are all complicit. I believe that as technologists, we have a moral imperative to prevent our work from being used to harm others. Responsibility is about impact, not intent. Freedom for freedom's sake is incompatible with our responsibility to society. And as Karen Sandler from the Software Freedom Conservancy once said to me, Software freedom must always be in service of human freedom. And the point is the way that people just like you react to the question of ethics and open source will determine the future of our community. You have the power to influence what happens next. If you're in the procrastination camp and think you can simply ignore the debate, you're in for a big disappointment. These issues are not going away and a growing body of developers is speaking out against it. If you want peaceful revolution, resolution, you're in the assimilation camp. So you can work with traditionalist philosophy organizations to focus less on licensure and more on promoting ethical standards, centering justice and equity in the practice of open source. But if the community refuses to acknowledge, let alone work to address the ethical shortcomings of free and open as it stands today, then the only option you leave us with is revolution. A proprietary printer driver sparked a massive paradigm shift in software development. Stallman saw what, is he, what he perceived as an ethical problem and created a brilliant way of solving it with licensing, and that's an epic hack. Today, we have much bigger ethical problems than proprietary software, and it's up to us to come up with another epic hack to solve that too. Stallman wanted a printer driver. We want to prevent our work from being used for human rights abuses, and that's what the revolution is about. We're all inspired by the promises of free and open, but we also need to expect, accept responsibility for impact and outcomes because in the end, we're all locksmiths and the world is full of mysterious strangers. If you wanna join us in working towards solutions to the ethical challenges we face today in open source, go to ethicalsource.dev, read through our resources, watch our talks and continue and consider joining us to collaborate on ways to resolve the crisis of conscience in open source. Thank you for listening.
Uh, thank you, Caroline. That was a really interesting talk. Um, there was a, a lot to think about there. Um, we are now, we have a few minutes for questions. So if people want to ask questions, please uh, write them in the chat or the questions bar. Um, while we wait for those, um, I have a question. Um, I thought it was really interesting that you brought up the um, point about uh, Thomas Kuhn um, and how various kinds of scientific research don't take place in a vacuum. They take place in a wider society. So they're not free from the influences of wider society. I wondered if you thought that um, changes, um, the changes that you were talking about, are they more likely to come from inside the community or is it pressure from outside the community, uh, the wider public that you think is going to lead to more changes? Um, I think the wider public doesn't have an understanding of the technical linkages um, between work that an individual or a small group of contributors to and how that gets magnified by an organization like Amazon or Microsoft. So I don't think, uh, I don't think we can rely on a public outcry to encourage engineers to accept social responsibilities. I really think it has to come from inside and we're seeing it come from inside. The ethical source working group is over 200 volunteers now. It's ethicists, philosophers, technologists, open source maintainers, human rights workers, academics, lawyers. There's a, a large and growing community of people who do take these problems very seriously and are working in a very creative manner to come up with different kinds of ways of solving the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, I'll just read this. So a few years ago at the Chaos Communication Congress, there was a call to build software in a surveillance resistant or resilient way. Do you think there is a way to build ethics uh, not only into licenses, but other things too? I actually uh, think licensing, I realize the ethical source movement is best known for having produced the Hippocratic license but our main focus is not on licensure. And we think in fact that the open source traditionalist focus on licensure is a shortcoming. Um, licensure is one tool and the working group is developing multiple tools to address this problem. Um, including, uh, you know, you can really think of it as ethics starting at home in a lot of ways, the way that we manage and govern our open source communities our codes of conduct and how we enforce them, our governance and how transparent that is. All of those are really critical to producing ethical software. And really it's about taking the time to think about outcomes, to think about how your software could be abused. If you think about it at the beginning, it's a lot easier to, to your example, to design for safety, to design so that the tools can't be easily abused. And we can't stop technology from being used in an abusive way, but we can put up boundaries. We can create incentives for doing things the right way. We can do a lot better.